Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We'll begin in just a few seconds as we let everyone come into the room and connect to their audio. All right. Good morning and welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council's weekly online briefing for faith leaders. Today we have San Francisco Police Department's Chief William Scott on policing in San Francisco in these times of George Floyd and Asian hate and violence. This event is hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the Joint Information Center of the San Francisco COVID Command Center. Some housekeeping for today. Audio, video, and chat will be monitored and recorded for record keeping, training, and quality assurance. By default, all participants will be muted and video turned off to minimize distraction. For chat, to submit a question or comment, select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A. They will be shared with the speakers and panelists after the meeting for response. Thank you. Get tested, San Francisco. You can save lives and stop the spread of COVID-19 by getting tested through your healthcare provider. If you don't have health insurance or can't get tested through your provider, visit sf.gov slash get tested SF or call 311 for information on getting tested at a city run testing location. A safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine coupled with continued preventative measures are our best tools to end the COVID-19 pandemic and safely reopen San Francisco. Go to sf.gov slash COVID vaccine for information on eligibility, vaccination sites, including locations and links to book appointments if available. Now is the time to come together, San Francisco. We've been through so much in the last year. Together, we can stop Asian discrimination, bias, hate, and violence. The COVID-19 virus has no race or nationality. It is simply a disease. To report a hate crime, please contact the San Francisco Police Department at 415-553-1133. Please note, that the San Francisco Interfaith Council is a sponsor of this program. And now at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Lisa, thank you so much. This is our 49th program together. And uh, without the support and the technical knowledge and staff and the platform at the Joint Information Center's uh, virtual outreach team, we would not be able to provide our faith leaders with so much of the information they need to make important judgments uh, on behalf of the care of those who are entrusted to them. Uh, good morning, I'm Michael Pappas and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this week's online briefing for faith leaders. Excessive uh, use of force and racial profiling have been issues with which law enforcement has historically grappled throughout the United States. This uh, uh, more recently, George Floyd's murder, trial, and verdict brought those issues to center stage. This week's online briefing for faith leaders, hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the COVID Command Center's Joint Information Center virtual outreach team welcome San Francisco Police Department Chief William Scott, who will address those issues as well as precautions being taken to protect our city's Asian community in these times of discrimination, hatred, and violence. Chief Scott will also respond to questions submitted in advance by San Francisco faith leaders. At this time, I welcome friend and colleague and chairman of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Kushik Roy, to offer a brief welcome and the interfaith statement. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kushik, and on behalf of the board of directors, it is my pleasure to extend a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. As Michael mentioned, we have had 49, or this is our 49th of these conversations, and we've had so many unique ones 
uh, over the last 14 months. But I think we really have, uh, even in that context, a special uh, opportunity today, given who our guest speaker is. Uh, by coincidence, I happened to tune in uh, to a, a Zoom panel that was happening yesterday evening on the topic of anti-hate. Um, and of course, some of the things we'll discuss this morning were also addressed there. And one of the panelists was the head of the Human Rights Commission, Cheryl Davis, and she said something that struck me that e yesterday evening uh, and has stayed with me going into this morning. It was a line from MLK, uh, which was that we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. I, I think that's very poignant in regards to our discussion this morning, and especially since we are people of faith gathering, uh, almost if not every one of our faith traditions shares that same message um, through, through the religious texts or their teachings. Uh, Chief Scott, the board wants to give a special welcome to you. Truly, you have always, you are a fixture at our annual events when we're having in-person events. Uh, when we start them up again, hopefully later this fall, no doubt we will see you there. Uh, for yourself to take the time to have this type of conversation with the interfaith community means a lot to not just Michael and me and the board, but we've heard a lot of positive feedback from other folks. Uh, just grateful to hear from you. So a special thank you to make for making the time to be with us. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank our mighty staff of two, Michael Pappas and Cynthia Zambukas. Uh, they just keep doing more and more in the city, not just the Interfaith Council, but the city is very fortunate to have two people who are as dedicated uh, as the two of them are. So thank you, uh, Cynthia and Michael. If this is your first time joining us, I wanna extend a special welcome to you and uh, I encourage you to not make this your last time. We hope we will see you again. At the beginning of every council event uh, or gathering, there is an interfaith statement we like to read. It's just a moment in a way to remind ourselves why we're all gathered here together in the first place. This is an interfaith community, whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Koshik, and thank you for your continued leadership and commitment to this program. You enrich the conversation uh, and, and these briefings. Bless you. Uh, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Butler is no stranger to this program. He has appeared in many different capacities, uh, today, we have asked him to lead us in a reflective moment to ground us for the presentation that will come. Dr. Butler is the associate pastor at Third Baptist uh, Church. He is uh, an assistant professional researcher of family community medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and he's the executive director of the African American uh, faith-based coalition. Dr. Butler, Reverend Dr. Butler, uh, we welcome you back and we ask you to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, uh, Michael and also Koshik and Chief Scott. Um, let us pray. Well, God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have together as a coalition of faith leaders and community leaders with a focus on helping those who are less fortunate, left off the least of these. We thank you, O oh God, for our task, our goal, our calling, and that is to sow good seeds into a world which needs uh, a ripe harvest. We pray, O oh God, that all the things that we do, bring in the good to those that are in need, bring in a smile to one's face. Uh, we pray, O oh God, that we will have a mindset of sowing a good seed. We pray, O oh God, that we would uh, reap a harvest as a consequence of the seeds that we're, we're sowing. When our kids are struggling in our schools, when there's housing discrimination, when we're still debating on 
whether everyone should have access to health care. This is the time for us to come together and sow the seed. When there's pro police brutality against our black and brown men and women, we need to sow seeds. When there is a tragedies that happen to our Asian brothers and sisters, it is now our time to sow the good seed. And this is the time to sow it. We should sow it now. And if there's anybody uh, that knows that we didn't get here as a consequence of our own seed sowing, that there were those that, that came before us that sowed seed so that we could reap the harvest. We pray, oh God, that we would um, have that same spirit of sowing so that those that come after us will be able to reap the harvest. And as Galatians 6 tells us, that we should not be misled, that we should not make a fool of God, that what a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants self and selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And all we have to show for our life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life eternal. And so we pray, oh God, that you would allow us to be agents of your seed sowing so that those that we sow can reap a great harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, Chief Scott, in many of our traditions, uh, at each one of our worship services, we pray for our civic leaders and those who protect us. I remember sitting uh, on January 23rd, 2017, uh, when you were welcomed to San Francisco and, and were inaugurated and sworn in. I remember praying for you because I knew the immense challenges that you were about to face. And I, and I remember seeing your beautiful family and, uh, and you reached out to the Interfaith Council very early on uh, and you sat and you met with faith, faith leaders very early on as you did in Los Angeles. Uh, I've come to know you as a man of great faith um, and great patience um, and great discernment. I want you to know that we continue to pray for you and for the force at this very uh, fragile time. And we welcome you. Uh, you know, you know the, the presentation you need to give. Um, and so without further ado, we welcome you uh, and we invite you to, to address us. Good morning and thank you very much, uh, Michael and, and to all the interfaith leaders on this call. Um, yeah, that seems like yesterday, uh, January 23rd, 2017. It's been over over four years, and I think um, I continue to ask for your prayers for me, my family, this department, and our city and nation. Uh, those prayers are needed right now, probably more than ever. But I just want to thank the Interfaith Co Council and, and Michael and, and many of you, so many of you that have really worked with us and 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 asked us the hard questions and challenged us, the police department, to continue to get better and implement reforms and protect our city in a way that I think our diverse communities expect us to. And that is really our goal. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning is how, how are we gonna do that in the midst of everything that's going on around our country and policing. So thank you for, for the welcome and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak with you this morning and answer many of your questions and really give you a state of a status update and check of where we are uh, with policing in San Francisco. So many of you uh, submitted questions that I have before me and the way I'd like to do this, uh, since many of your questions centered around a reform and where are we in reform and how are we gonna make things better in terms of how we police our city, I have a presentation really that speaks to the heart of our reform efforts and the status of that. It's a pretty long presentation and some of these slides, I, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time so we can get through it and I can address the questions. But before I start the presentation, I wanna, I wanna highlight some of the questions that I believe will be addressed in this presentation. And I'll, I'll start with a question by uh, Deacon G.L. Hodge. And that question is, how do you plan to implement change in the San Francisco Police Department when the police union is against it? And what are your plans to hire people from the communities that they, that they live in? Uh, so I think that'll be addressed in this presentation. Um, here's another question, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, this is for, from Reverend Vanessa, Vanessa Rush Southern. Um, 
she had about four questions, but I think the presentation speaks to at least half of her questions. Uh, several years ago, it came to light that racist and misogynist, misogynist text messaging was going on among SFPD members. In terms of the preventative training and support for our, our police, what steps have you taken or will you take to measure that police are not infected by hateful ideologies that color, quote, color their attitudes and actions? I think that'll be addressed as well. Another question from uh, Reverend Southern is since 2016, the SFPD has attempted to move forward with reforms recommended by the federal and state Department of Justice, Departments of Justice. Now, four years later, less than half of the 272 federal recommendations have been accomplished. Yet, for instance, it is reported that SFPD still disproportionately stops and uses force against Black and Latinx people. What are the plans for completion and implementation of reforms recommended by the USDOJ? So that certainly will be answered in this presentation. Uh, other questions that I think this presentation will address. Uh, PJ Charon um, asked, even after a great deal of de-escalation training, an arrest can still go sideways. If an officer improperly pins someone down by the neck, et cetera, what are colleague, colleagues supposed to do in the moment to stop the officer. Uh, the next question by uh, PJ Charon, do you think our nation should have a national system for training and licensing law enforcement officers? Should certification and employment records of law enforcement officers be public and transparent? So that's not in the presentation, but I'll speak to that uh, as well. And then there are other questions that I, I plan to get to all of your questions before we're done. So I'm gonna start with the presentation. I'll get through it as quickly as possible so we can leave time for questions and answers and dialogue. So again, thank you. And I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen here, uh, hopefully. Okay, can you all see uh, the, the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the crux of this presentation, it really speaks to all of the reform questions. And in this presentation, I think it'll address a lot of the other questions specifically about how we are addressing the, the texting scandal that, that we had a few years ago and um, some of the issues around bias and use of force and um, which the reform is a very, very expansive uh, initiative that I believe will answer a lot of your questions. Okay, let's see here. Let me... Fast forward, okay. As uh, Re Re Michael said, 2017, this was January 27, 2017, when Mayor Ed Lee swore me in. And one of the reasons that I think I was selected for this job is because of uh, not only my commitment to moving policing forward, but I had gone through a massive reform effort in LAPD at various levels of the Los Angeles Police Department. Those of you that have heard me speak on this, know what I'm saying. But basically, um, I was with LAPD for 27 years. And of those 27 years, 13 of it, LA was in a, a massive consent decree reform effort, which uh, we were one of the few departments that actually completed the consent decree. And the federal judge monitor, who was responsible for ensuring that we were doing what we promised the public, actually uh, found us in substantial compliance. So that was a, a transformative experience for me. And as I sought to assume the role of chief of police here in San Francisco, um, that's what I brought to the table in terms of having that experience of having done reform in my career. Our reform initiative, as was stated, was um, the report and the assessment was done in 2016 by the US Department of Justice. And basically, um, we had a, a top to bottom review of our police department. And the 272 yeah. recommendations that have been asked about were the result of the recommendations by the USDOJ. And, and they believed if we complete those 272 recommendations, not only will, will we be a reform police department, but we'd be a model police department for others to follow. And that really is one of our goals is to be a model of reform. So in 2018 or late 2017, the US DOJ, uh, when we had a change in the presidential administration decided they were out of the reform business. And San Francisco along with 13 other departments across the country 
who had initiated this type of reform model basically were told overnight, we're done with this type of work, you guys are on your own. San Francisco was one of, I think we were the only city that said, no, we're not done. We're going to try to re-engage with our state Department of Justice and kickstart this work and basically start over with our state US, I mean, State Department of Justice and take the same assessment, the same recommendations and get new collaborative partners so we can complete the work. So 2018, uh, that's when we really started over. And at the beginning, I got it, I must admit, it was it was slow moving. Uh, to everybody's displeasure and disappointment, we 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 were moving slow at the beginning. In 2018, we had only completed 13 of the 272 recommendations. And when I say completed, the way that process works is we do everything uh, to complete the recommendations based on agreed upon compliance measures. That work is then reviewed by a consultant, Hillard Hines and the California Department of Justice, who independently takes a look at our work. And, and they are actually the ones, mainly the California DOJ, to validate whether or not we have completed the work. So 2018, we were 13. And you can see the progression uh, as to where we are right now. And actually, we, we're a little bit above 239. But as of today, we have submitted 239 recommendations. The California DOJ the Department of Justice has validated that we're compliant with 175 of those recommendations. And the difference between the 239 and the 175, they're in the process of being reviewed. Now, I'll take a minute to explain kind of how that process works because I think it's important for you all to understand that. So we have these recommendations that we've submitted all the paperwork, the documentation uh, to both Hillard Hines, our consultant, and the California DOJ. And they, by per our MOU, have about 45 days. They usually take about a month and a half to get through reviewing the recommendations. And then they'll come back to us and tell us whether or not they believe we are substantially compliant. Leading up to submitting, submitting the recommendations, we have a process called pre-screening, where we stay in contact with our consultant, Hillard Hines, and the California DOJ. And we iron out any if they see what they believe are deficiencies in the work that we're doing, we iron that out during this pre-screening process. So by the time we, we, we submit this recommendation, we have about a 96, 97% rate of being found substantially compliant because that pre-screening process, we iron out all the details. So we fully expect that uh, the, the difference between the 239 and the 175 will be found in substantial compliance. In addition to that, we have another uh, 10, 11 recommendations that will be submitted uh, by the middle of next week. And we believe those will be in substantial compliance. So by the middle of next week, the end of next week, for sure, we believe we will have about 250 recommendations complete which is about 90, I think it's 91 or 92% of the recommendations. The remainder, um, we're gonna have to spend a little bit of time and get more funding to shore up some of our technology shortfalls. And we hope um, that our budget requests that we have right now being put in through the mayor's office and eventually that will go before the board of supervisors will be granted so we can finish the work that we promised our city that we would finish. So we're actually in really good shape. And more importantly, we have really good outcomes, which I'll talk about uh, in this presentation. So here's how we did what we're doing. 2017, when I got here, I asked the police commission and the mayor uh, to be given the authority and the, the funding to restructure the police department. One of the, the shortages that I saw with our department uh, in 2009, 2008, when we had the Great Recession, we lost a lot of positions. We lost some executive positions, and it really it put us in a, a disadvantage, at a disadvantage because part of policing, in addition to what's being done every day by the officers, is oversight, and it's really checks and balances to make sure that the things that we are supposed to be doing, we are doing. 
And you have to have an administrative, a strong administrative and oversight component of any police department in order to really do that. Um, if you look at any department that, that has been driven or forced to reform, I can guarantee you what you have found or what we have found if we study these departments is a, a weakened infrastructure. So what you see before you is the infrastructure that we put in place. What you see in yellow are positions that we didn't have prior to 2017. Uh, we had had assistant chief positions in the past in this department because of the recession and budget, th those positions were cut. Uh, it hurts our oversight. We had never had the, the non-sworn director positions that you see in that second and third and fourth and fifth lines. Uh, these are new positions that were added to increase the oversight and actually uh, drive the reform. So those are new positions that we've, we've implemented over the last four years. And those positions have been pivotal into getting us to this uh, where we are right now, where we have submitted you know, over 90% of our, our work in terms of reform. So that was the infrastructure that has been put in place that has put us in a much better position, not only to implement the reform, but to more importantly, sustain the reform and continue to be relevant in terms of our policy updates and revisions that we know we need to do to keep our department moving in the right direction. Here are the five buckets of reforms that I said it was a top to bottom assessment of our department. Uh, recruitment and hiring, personnel practices, bias, and that goes to the texting scandal and a lot of uh, what got us here in terms of the need to, to implement these reforms. Use of force, and I'll speak in more detail about that. Um, we wanted to reduce force. We wanted to reduce uh, the, the number of officer involved shootings. We want to reduce the disparities. And although we have a lot of work in that area, we have reduced the disparities among people of color. Accountability, uh, we needed a more accountable department. A part of building trust in the community, many in our community, particularly in communities of color, didn't see where officers were being held accountable, at least to, to, to their satisfaction. And that was one of the, uh, the areas of reform. And then community policing, which is the, is the backbone of how we do our business here in San Francisco. And we needed to shore up in our community policing efforts. So I'm gonna talk in more detail about that. So recruitment, hiring, and personnel practices. One of our guiding principles is we have to treat everybody that we come in contact with, with dignity and respect and fairness. And I know that might sound to some cliche, uh, being uh, that I'm talking to interfaith and pastors and, and, and that comes by nature with you all and it should by, come by nature to us, but in reality, it doesn't always happen. And we have to be that department that no matter whether you're at your worst day or best day, when we come in contact with you, no matter whether you just murdered somebody or we're just stopping to say hello, we have to treat you with dignity, fairness, and respect. And, and we failed in that in some areas. So this is really, we wanted to go back to the basis of what policing is all about and make sure we reinforce those values because really that's what trust is. It's about values and, and adhering to your values. So it's crucial for our members to carry out their duties in that manner. Bias and eliminating bias is a part of that. Um, and I'll speak in detail to what we're doing. So part of what we did in 2017 is we created a staffing and deployment unit. We didn't really have an uh, analytical component to really look at our staffing and how we are policing the, the city. We did it kind of anecdotally. Uh, we, we, we knew we needed to shore that up. So we did a couple of field trips around the state anyway, and actually around the country, we visit Seattle, Los Angeles, and a few other departments because they were good in that area. And we really modeled after them and we created this analytical uh, entity in our department, the staffing and deployment unit. And one of the things that we look at in, from an analytical perspective is how we deploy, who are we putting in communities at the district stations? And it starts with diversity. We, we want as much as we can do this, our, our district stations to reflect the diversity of the communities that they, they are part of. And so we do a much better job now because we put the tools and the infrastructure in place to really look at that issue. And that staffing and deployment unit was created in part to address that issue. In terms of recruitment and hiring, one of the uh, several of the recommendations spoke to our diversity goals. 
and that we needed to be diverse at all levels of the department. And I'm going to show you a chart in a second to show you what progress we made in that area, which has been rather significant in the last five years. But it, for those of you that are intimately familiar with the reform initiative, the recommendations listed speak directly to diversity. And we created a diversity strategic plan really to address that. And this roadmap for us for uh, the next several years of how we, we are going to reach our diversity goals. And that includes our hiring, our field training, our professional development, and our organizational accountability in terms of diversity. We've never had that type of strategic plan in this department. So I'm really happy and pleased with how that's going. And you'll see the results uh, in, in the coming slides. Also, our training division plays a big part of diversity. We want to improve our personnel retention, which we're struggling with, to be quite frank with you. We lost and, and continue to lose a lot of officers. And uh, the state of policing doesn't help us. Many officers are wanting, wanting to live closer to home and go to departments where things may be a little bit easier. Uh, and we're seeing those trends in our department. So we're really reviewing our attrition rates and seeing what we can do internally to retain those officers that we do hire because we do believe we hire some good people who have a tremendous potential to be great police officers, but we have to retain them. So we're, we're trying to refine those efforts and retain the officers that we do hire. And that's what recommendations 88.1 and 88.3 speak to. And we are have been found in substantial compliance on those recommendations. I, I talked about our struggle with recruitment and this speaks directly to our, our, our diversity. As we see the number of applicants go down, we also have to really focus on, you know, who we, who we are recruiting. We want our communities to be reflective of, of San Francisco or our recruits. But here's what we've seen in the last five years in terms of our applicant pool. As you can see, it's been cut almost by 2,200 applicants. And really what that means is uh, our academy classes are shrinking and it becomes harder to recruit that diverse uh, police officer that we wanna bring in the department. But despite this, this trend, we have been able to increase our diversity, which I'll show you in a second, but this is an, it's, it's kind of really speaks to what's going on in policing right now. We have literally lost recruits who we had offered um, offers of employment. Uh, they were set to get in the academy and every time we have a incident uh, that uh, unfortunate or tragic or, or you know, George Floyd type of incident, some of the recruits are saying, you know, I changed my mind. I, I no longer want to do this job. And, and we really have to change that around. And I know we're one, we San Francisco police are one of about 18,000 police departments. But what we have to do for us to change that is be a model. And for those that have an interest in, in, in being police officers, what we want is them to look at us and say, I want to work for that department because they're doing business the way that I think I'd like to do business. So that's what we're trying to do with all of our reform, but it's a struggle because of this trend that, that, that you're seeing on your screen. So here's our diversity uh, record. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time to give you time to process this because I think this is very, very encouraging. Um, as I said, we have a diversity strategic plan right now. And if you look at our last 14 years of hiring, this represents who we are bringing in the doors of the police department through our police academy. And in 2007, you can see the, the kind of teal uh, portion of the graph was the number of, of white uh, recruits coming in the academy, which was at 54%. Uh, Hispanics is the green, Asian is blue, African-American is orange, Filipino is red, and then other is the, the uh, the kind of lavender looking graph. And then Native American is yellow or gold. So when you look through the, the years leading up to 2020, what you see is the number of white recruits coming through the academy has gone from 54% to 27%. Now, let me just be clear on saying this because we, we, we're not anti-white. We have some officers across the spectrum of, of these, all of these races that are, that are outstanding officers. But the issue here is, is diversity. 
we know how important diversity is to our city and we want to be a police department that's diverse that reflects the diversity of our city. And that's exactly what we've done over the last 14 years. If you look from 2016 to 2020, you see that that diversity has increased pretty significantly across the board. Uh, you look at the number of Asian officers that are coming in the, in the academy, is going up to 29% in 2020. You look at the number of black officers, it's, it was at 15%, which is the highest, it's, it's, with the exception of 2016, is the, is the second highest in the, in the last 14, 13 years. You look at the number of Filipino officers, it's been pretty steady around you know, 5%, but we haven't lost any ground. And then uh, the other category is been pretty, pretty steady as well. But we're actually pleased with the way we are going with diversity and, and our hiring. And again, saying what I said a minute ago, we have to retain the diversity that we're bringing in the department. But we're really pleased with that. And I think that answers some of the questions about how we plan to get to a better place in policing our city. Diversity matters. People understanding the perspectives of the people that they police, understanding the cultures and the history being relatable, being empathetic, and all those things speak to our values. And that's what diversity does for us. So we are really, really uh, pleased with the progress that we made in increasing our diversity. I talked about, and this just really kind of further explains what I just said. So bias and being a bias free police department. Now this speaks to several of the questions, you know, dignity, respect, fairness, all those things really, it, it goes to being empathetic, understanding the person that you're, you're, you're interacting with, understanding histories, understanding the history of our country, which has not been good in terms of racial relations and the, 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 the way uh, people of color have had to struggle just to get equal rights in our country. So our officers need to understand that history and they, need to understand that, particularly the younger officers, that some people uh, may mistrust us, not because of what that individual officer has done, it's because of their experiences. And part of being a bias-free police department is really understanding where people are coming from. And that speaks directly to what I just spent five minutes talking about, about diversity and not having um, a coalition of diverse perspectives to police our city. So that's really the, 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 the crux of, of getting to being a bias-free police department, but there are other, many other things that we have to do to get there. I'm gonna spend a minute talking about our, our reform efforts and working with our academic partners, Stanford, the, uh, their Spark Lab, and that's uh, PhD level, professors from Stanford who have spent their life really understanding the science of bias and implicit bias and how to mitigate, eliminate, and make sure that those things don't creep into the workplace. That is especially important in policing because what we know about the science of bias is when you have implicit biases and you're under stress and you have to react without really thinking through or being able to think through those implicit biases come through. So for instance, if you believe, and I'm going to just going to use an example here because I think it's re very relevant to today's world, that African-Americans, uh, because of however your experiences and your personal experiences and what you see on the news and what you've been taught in your upbringing, you think that African-American males have a higher propensity of committing crime and a higher propensity of violence. So you're in a situation where you have to act immediately and you have to think really quickly without thinking. That's where your instincts and your, if you have implicit biases, that's where they're bound to manifest. And there's a lot of research on this, on this subject. And what the research so shows is, uh, and study after study, oftentimes in a policing situation, I'll give you a, uh, an example. This is a real body of research. An African-American male and a white male, uh, they both have objects in their hands, let's say a cell phone in their hand. And a scenario is, is given, it's in a sterile environment, let me go back, in a sterile environment and the scenario is given where it's a stressful situation, it's a, maybe a crime of violence and 
the object in the hand pops up. Now, what the research has shown, that African-American male that has, let's say, a phone in their hand, officers pull the trigger quicker and they shoot more often compared to that phone being in the hand of a white person. That is the essence of how implicit bias can come into play in that type of situation. So we have to learn what our biases are, first of all, and we have to do that in a way that officers understand that we all have biases, every last one of us, everybody on this call has a bias, whether we like to believe that we don't or, or not, we do. And we have to learn how to mitigate and work around those biases to make sure that it doesn't impact our decision making. And one of the best ways to do that is to create ways to slow ourselves down through our policies, through our training. And that's why time and distance and our crisis intervention training and giving ourselves just an extra few seconds to react to emergencies is so important. And that is the really the crux of our policy making. And that's what our academic partners have really taught us. And, I, and we have put a lot of that in place. And I think that's why you see such a significant reduction in shootings and, and use of force in our city. But that's a really piece, an important piece of reform. And I know several questions spoke to this about how we're gonna get there. This is a really important piece of how we plan to get there. And we're seeing some, some really, really good outcomes. So I talk about our academic partnerships and I'm gonna speed this up because I know I'm, I'm running along here. Uh, Center for Policing Equities is one of our academic partnerships. They did, did an extensive re review of our use of force and our stops. I talked about Stanford. Also our work with the California DOJ and, and their, uh, their uh, RIPA board and that's Racial Identity and Profiling Act board who the California DOJ actually collects data on stops, searches, use of force, all the things that we need to continue to monitor and, and keep a close eye on to see if we're getting better. Uh, they, they actually collect that data and anybody that's interested, if you go on their website, you can see what different departments are doing and how we're tracking. And San Francisco Police Department, I, I must, uh, I'm pleased to say we are showing improvement over time in that area. So that data analysis is really, really important. That's why we're pushing so hard to invest in technology so we can collect the information so the public and the academic partners and the world can see what we're doing. And that's really important. I spoke about policy. Really the crux of our policy is let's slow our people down. Give them a minute to think. Give them time to create time, space and distance so they have a minute to think and they're not being put in a position where they have to react. Uh, sometimes it's unavoidable, but as much as we can can slow ourselves down and not have to react in a split second, it really does go toward reducing or allowing uh, implicit bias to, to rule the day. And that's really, really important. And then our training, honoring diversity in communities of color in every module of training, uh, development of virtual reality training. And I'll talk a little bit about that. We gotta use technology to our advantage. And there's some outstanding virtual reality-based training that brings real life scenarios to life. So you can get in the habit of slowing down and creating time and distance in a, in a controlled environment. And so we're developing that out with our partners, our academic partners. And here are some of, uh, specifically, there was a question about the texting scandal and how we are addressing that, that issue. One of the recommendations specifically, specifically spoke to that issue. And what we put in place is um, auditing all of our electronic devices and computers for, for language of bias or language of racism. And we have an algorithm that we've developed and there's keywords and key phrases that are in that algorithm. And every email, text message, uh, every inquiry that's made on the computer for every member of this department from me down to the new incoming recruits is audited on a regular basis. And if any language that is used, like what was used and that was found to be used in that, in that texting incident, it gets, it gets uh, discovered and those officers get held to account. Uh, we, ha we have had some discipline arising from those audits. And fortunately we have not had the type of language that was found in that texting incident, but we have had some issues that where we've had to discipline officers and hold them to account. 
So um, that's one step among many that we're doing, but that is in place and that is you know, a recommendation that we have been found to be in compliance. Also, a bias-free policing general order that was updated uh, and is relevant. And we were one of the first in the country, California DOJ actually uh, applauded us for this, to include language about bias by proxy in our bias um, general order. And what bias by proxy is, for those of you who are, are not familiar with that, you see these instances around the country and they always make the news where a person calls uh, on usually a person of color, many times an African-American male for things like a bird watching in the park. Uh, this person is attacking me or about to attack me. Found out that that was totally a made up fabricated because the guy was bird watching or the person having a barbecue at the apartment complex at the swimming pool area African-American you know, family and somebody calls in saying they don't belong here. Uh, they're doing something wrong and they just are minding their own business. That's bias by proxy. That's when somebody else's bias causes a call to the police and causes us to respond and, and uh, sometimes react on somebody else's bias. And what we train our officers is don't react to somebody else's bias. Slow down, get the facts, do an investigation, and if this is a call that's clearly uh, somebody else's bias, do the right thing. We're one of the first, if not the first department that actually put that in writing so our officers know what to look for and how to handle that type of situation. And we were applauded for that. And uh, a lot of our training speaks to trying to mitigate that. But then we have all of our mitigation efforts for our internal biases that I spoke about implicit bias training and those type of things. So we are doing a lot, a lot on that on that effort. And then we have a bias free and racial equity uh, plan. And this was really a, a, a vision of the mayor. Every city department has to have a racial equity and inclusion plan. And we have jumped out on on ours. We submitted it. It's in, it's in the works right now. Uh, we're in the process of implementing our plan and it's really designed to be inclusive. Uh, to call out racism and, and institutionalize uh, sy systemic racism in our department and really deal with it in a way that we haven't before. And, and that speaks to a lot of the questions that were asked of how we were dealing with that. Well, this racial equity and inclusion action plan is a way to deal with a lot of those issues. And it's a very involved plan. It's over 100 pages, so I can't go into a whole lot of detail with the time uh, we have this morning. but. It's, on, it's online if you want to look at it. Use of force. This was really the crux of our reform, and I'm going to wrap this up in the next uh, few minutes. This is what really drove the US DOJ to take a look at the San Francisco Police Department. You know, my pred predecessor, Greg Sir, uh, had the vision to really say we need help. Uh, we had a series of, of officer involved shootings that unfortunately and sadly resulted in deaths of black and brown men and women. Mario Woods is one of them. Uh, Amakar Lopez, Jessica Williams, they, they were like, you know, a string of them. And, and that was really what got us here in the, in, in the police department. So really one of the most important DGOs that we had to really revise and re-envision right away was our use of force general order. That was done in December of 2016, about a month before I got here. But I was fortunate enough to, to once, I was named to be the appointed chief to be involved in having discussions about that general order even before I was officially sworn in. So I can tell you it's a very thoughtful general order. It was one of the most complete and progressive use of force general orders in the country. There's this uh, watchdog group called Campaign Zero that on their website, they constantly look at police department use of force policy across the country. We were the first, I think we were the first uh, major city that checked all eight of their, th their, their policy uh, must haves that they say it means that you have a good policy. We were the first to check all eight. And I'm really proud of that. Now many others have followed suit, but you know, barring of the chokehold, not shooting and moving vehicles, 
uh, time and distance and, and, and de-escalation being in the policy. Those are some of the key components in our use of force policy. And those were implemented in December of 26. And we further revised it to make sure we don't have, and this is one of the questions, the inadvertent knee on the neck or pressure on the neck after the George Floyd incident. So that revision was made in July of last year. And it's gone through the meet and confer and that process is over and that will actually be actually implemented in about three weeks. So that policy, I believe, really set the course for us to uh, reduce our use of force. And here's just a sample of the, the policy and I'll go through this, but here are the results. Uh, as you can see, 2016, where we were with total use of forces by quarter, this is every three months. And uh, 2020, last quarter, you can see it's been almost cut in half. Uh, that's significant. That is significant. And that's significant progress. It's, it's been overcut in half, actually. And uh, that's a result of not only a good policy, but our, our officers complying with the policy. Here is a breakdown by race. And you know, one of the things and the questions speak to use of force against African-American and Blacks. Uh, as you see, the, the gray chart uh, at the top chart is where we have made the most improvement in terms of reducing force, that demographic. And it has been significant a significant decline and we hope to continue to, to, to decline. Now, let me say this clearly. We, we are not there yet because the disparities, when we look at per capita breakdowns and all that, it's still a lot of whack among Black African-American demographics. But we have gotten better with that category and we've reduced force the most dramatically in that category. So, so that's a good thing. It's a major step in the right direction. And we hope to keep that going in the right direction. Accountability, I talked about our auditing. I talked about one of the things that we've done is we restructured our internal affairs division and how we investigate our office involved shootings. And actually the district attorney's office now has a lead on the criminal investigation on, on not only an office involved shooting, but we've expanded that. Any use of force that results in hospitalization is, is, a, is what's called in our MOU a covered incident. And the district attorney's office actually has a lead on those investigations. Now we still, do our, our administrative investigation on policy, but the district attorney's office has a lead. And that was one of the questions of, do I support uh, the district attorney's office in holding officers accountable? And yes, I do. And uh, that was one of the ways that I supported it in this department. We gave that responsibility over to them. Uh, and so now they do that independently and, and they do that investigation independently of us. Although we have to jointly work on, because we still have our internal investigations that we have to do, but it, it's a uh, MOU that we're about to renew and uh, we're going through that process right now, but that's a major step in the right direction. It's not a perfect scenario, but it's a major step in the right direction. Community policing um, is the crux of what we do. And I'll get through this in a couple of seconds. Uh, we've done a lot of work and really, the backbone of our community policing efforts, we, we created, recreated our general order and we now have a community policing strategic plan that had a tremendous amount of community input. Uh, Deputy Chief at the time, Commander David Lazar led that effort. Uh, he outreached over 500 community members. I think some of you on this call probably were part of that process to get input and feedback. And we have a really, really dynamic community policing strategic plan as a result. And that's really gonna be, be our roadmap of how we better engage with the community. And so that is the presentation. I think I've answered a lot of the questions. Uh, I know there's probably more questions and I didn't answer all of them. So I'll take this moment to pause, give you all time to process all of what I just said and then I, I'm available for question and answer. So thank you very much. Chief, thank you so much for this thoughtful and comprehensive presentation. You've made my job easier uh, in that you answered so many of the questions. I know that especially on bias, you answered uh, Rita Semmel's questions and Rabbi Singer's questions. Uh, and PJ Sharon had an interesting uh, uh, dimension to this, which I just ask you to take just a moment to drill down on, and that was on the issue of bias. Um, Describe how SFPD cadets are screened 
before they're hired? Uh, and what sort of implicit bias training are they given in the academy? Oh, that's, thank you, PJ, for that question. So um, one of the things that Mayor Bree uh, did to, on top of this reform initiative is in August of last year, we had to pause all of our hiring, all of our promotion, and work with our department, uh, city department of human resources to implement uh, more bias screening measures in the hiring process. And specifically questions on the entry testing. We actually had to work with our testing uh, vendor, the National Testing Network, NTN, to implement questions to try to determine if uh, a potential recruit had a propensity for bias. And so we, we, we had to actually, we paused our hiring to put these, these, these steps in, in practice. And it, it took us uh, several months to develop that us with, in conjunction with DHR, but those steps are now in place. So now we have measures in our hiring to screen for that. Uh, we also have put it, those steps in our promotional process, our sergeants testing, uh, we updated our sergeants test, actually all of our civil service promotion process, where if an officer has a complaint that is found true, that they've engaged in some type of biased conduct, if they survive that, because if it's really egregious, they're gonna probably be recommended to the commission for termination in the first place. But let's say they survive that, they are expelled from the prom promotional process. Uh, the, the union has agreed to that and that is now in place and that's a first, we've never had that before. So that can be a disqualifier for both entry and it's a disqualifier for the promotional process. So that, that's pretty significant. Chief, you know, we saw these very graphic images uh, during the George Floyd trial uh, of, uh, you know, what happens when an officer is supposed to do, what is, it, what is an officer supposed to do when an arrest goes sideways and a fellow officer is using a knee to pin someone down? What, is, what are the officers surrounding that person supposed to do? That's a very good question, and thank you for that. And I missed this when I talked about use of force, but one of the policy revisions in our use of force policy is a, um, a mandate for a duty to intervene. Mm -hmm. And so if that happens um, and it's inappropriate, all officers have a responsibility by policy now to intervene. And if they don't, they can be found guilty if they have proven to be true they can be found uh, to be out of policy on their duty to intervene. That was not in our policy before. Now I'm gonna take a step back here. You, you would hope that you would hire people who would do that just because it's the right thing to do and that would be in their, in their core values. But we've had to put it in policy because we, we failed at that. You know, Not only this department, but across the country. So many departments now are putting that in their policy. We have it in our policy. But here's, here's a, a reality of, of force, you know, sometimes when it's a hectic situation and uh, officer is tussling with a person that they're trying to take into custody, it can happen inadvertently where you, 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 you end up inadvertently being in the head area. What we have revised our policy currently is to address that issue because if it happens inadvertently, the officers have to, number one, have the presence of mind to see that they're in the head and neck area and that's prohibited and they have to, they have to adjust. As a, matter, so as a matter of fact, let's say I'm, I'm, you know, a person is fighting with me. He's trying to get away, she's trying to get away and we're rolling around on the ground and for whatever reason, I pin them by you know, the head and neck area. I have to readjust and other officers that see this have to make an attempt to say, hey, you know, get off the neck, get off the head or whatever, because it does happen. And sometimes it's inadvertent. The problem becomes when it happens and you're not aware of it or purposefully you keep pressure on that person's neck to where they can't breathe or you stop the blood flow. That's where we have a problem. And so our policy is designed to, to really understand that in the heat of, of the moment, those things can happen inadvertently, but you have to have the presence of mind to adjust to not stay there in that position 
And if you see that, you know, tap your partner on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, readjust or whatever. And that's what we have to do. And that's what our policy now says we have to do. I want to be very respectful of your time. We, do you have time for a couple more questions? I do. I okay, do. great, great. Uh, GL Hodge asks, uh, Deacon GL Hodge from Providence Baptist Church asks an, an important question, an uncomfortable question, but I'm going to pose it to you. How do you plan to implement change in the San Francisco Police Department when the police union is against it? And I'm so going to part, of, part of the process is Sometimes you can't, you, you can't, I can't, you know, I can't control what the union does or thinks. And uh, we have to force change sometimes, whether the union likes it, whether the rank and file likes it or not. And that's not, you know, it doesn't make me or any chief of police who has that type of focus, the most popular person in the world, which is perfectly okay with me because it's about doing what's right. Now we have a legal process with the union by law, anything that affects their working conditions, their safety, they have a right uh, to meet and confer on those policy changes. It does not mean they have a right to block it. And so what we've done to streamline, and this, is, this has been a, a very contentious issue in San Francisco, because as you all know, when we implemented the use of force policy that I just talked about, the union took the department and the city to court and they tried to force an injunction to stop the use of force policy. Our city attorney's office did a great job. They, they, they prevailed. And despite the union objections, we were able, the commission was able to implement the policy. And sometimes it has to come to that. They have a right to do it. Uh, we have a right to push back and say, you know, we don't agree. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna implement the policy, but we have to meet and confer on those issues. What we have done to streamline that meet and confer process is we have hired within the police department, the, uh, the negotiator from the Department of Human Resources that did the majority of our meet and confer uh, meetings. And that's uh, uh, Luana Preston. We hired her from DHR and now she's a part of the police department. And what, what that has done actually is a couple of things. When she was with DHR, not only did she have the police department, but she had SEIU, which is you know the biggest union in the city. So her her attention was divided, and a lot of the slowdown was just due to calendar, you know, the calendars. She couldn't get to these meet and confer uh, procedures in a in a timely manner. So now her only focus is policing issues. She's very experienced at it. Since we've hired her, our meet and confers have been substantially cut in terms of the time that it's taken us to get through that process. Uh, I think the, the longest is, say, we, we hired her last, I want to say June of, of last year. Um, the longest it's taken, I think, is uh, probably about four or five months. And when the past, that's taken a year, a year and a half, sometimes longer. The shortest is taken is a couple of weeks. So we, by, by law, have to have that meet and confer process. Sometimes a uh, POA doesn't agree. Okay, they don't agree. But if it's the right thing to do, we're going to push forward. And if they take us to court, our city attorneys are behind us and we've been able to prevail. So in a best case scenario, you know, we work with the POA and we work collaboratively to imp in implement reform, but they don't always agree. But we have to keep moving forward and we can't let that stop us. Now, where, where it becomes difficult is the union has the really the power to impact morale. You know, if they start a negative uh, uh, campaign about a policy or about the command staff or about, you know, the state of everything is terrible, they, they do kind of, they creep in the mindset of how officers think. And, and so any, you know, police chief understands that. So you try to mitigate that with, you know, doing the right thing, keeping people positive, making people as much as you can do this, really understand why we are doing what we're doing. That is so important. Most officers get it. If we take the time to explain why we're doing it for the good of policing, for the good of our city, most officers get it. And we can get through that, those, those negative campaigns. But it's, it's a battle and it's a struggle, but you know, we prevailed and we're gonna continue to push forward. I know how important words are, and I want to just clarify and apologize if, if there was any offense taken. Uh, I made a reference to the George Floyd trial. I meant to say the George Floyd murder, the Derek Chauvin uh, trial, and uh, 
that was, and I stand corrected, and I apologize for any offense that that might have caused. Um, I, you know, another elephant in the room we've got, and we've, you know, I, our our dear brother, uh, Reverend Norman Fong from Presbyterian Church of Chinatown is on the line now. <clears throat> you know, we've got about a third of our population is Asian here in San Francisco. Uh, I know that uh, we're in a, a time where we're dealing almost on a daily basis with serial Asian, uh, anti-Asian violence, hatred, and discrimination. How is SFPD uh, ensuring, what precautions are you taking to ensure the safety of our of our Asian citizens in San Francisco? Well, uh, that's, a, oh, that's a really uh, good and important question given what's going on in our, our city and our country today. We, we've implemented a few uh, measures that hopefully will make things better. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the goal is to prevent these types of hateful crimes from happening in the first place. We can't always prevent everything from happening because we can't prevent bad people from doing bad things all the time. Part of how we can prevent it is be present in the communities. If we can't be on every corner, I wish we could, but even if we're on every corner, we have to do our business the right way. And when I say the right way, it's not about harassing and oppressing a community. It's about being out there, engaging in the community, putting officers, particularly uh, foot patrols, or, or you know, we have in some areas in the city where officers go on bicycles, uh, officers that are in the cars, stopping and talking to people and getting out of their cars and really engaging and getting to know their community then getting to a place where people feel comfortable trusting that we are there for them. Part of the struggle, particularly with uh, our Asian American Pacific Islander AAPI population, there is a trust factor there where people don't feel comfortable, some people are uh, reporting when they've actually had crimes committed with them. And, and we believe that those crimes are probably under underreported. That has everything to do with trust. Um, and we want to continue to do our business in a way where we, we continue to build trust and we need people to report the crime so we know where the problems are. The other thing that we've done is we, we're expanding. Um, a lot of hate type of incidents happen or prejudice-based incidents happen that are not crimes. For instance, you know, just hateful speech. And I'll, I'll quote some that's been you know, told to me where somebody is, is confronted and uh, Asian person, go back to your country. You know, we know all the rhetoric about the coronavirus and that just hateful language. We actually want people to report that because we can take an incident report on that. And although it's not a crime, if we can identify who, you know, we, we're not gonna do an expensive, expansive investigation on that, but let's say you know the person who did it. Let's say the person is your neighbor and you know him. Your neighbor, Bill, you know, as you were going about your business, made a derogatory, racially insensitive comment. Go back to your country. You brought the coronavirus here, something like that. Report it. Because we'll take an incident report and we'll list the, the person who made that comment as your neighbor, Bill. And if Bill then commits a crime on you, guess what? We can actually go back to that incident report and that might prove that that crime was actually a hate crime. Because part of the struggle is a lot of these acts that are happening to our AAPI brothers and sisters in our community, community members, we can't prove they're hate crimes because they don't meet the elements of hate crime. We can't prove that they're motivated by hate or prejudice. Well, if I have a pattern of making racial derogatory remarks, whether or not it's a crime, and then I go out and assault somebody from that race that I'm making all these, the DA's office can use that as evidence. So that's why we want people to report it. So we've expanded our reporting. We're in the process now of actually training our officers on that. We need people to report those type of things. Sometimes it might just be the guy in the, in the white car or the red car you know, wearing the blue suit made this comment. But if that's reported enough, maybe we get a name and then maybe we connect that to an actual crime. That's one why we the, want to report those things. Yeah, one of the things that we will do at the conclusion of today's program is send this recording link out to our 5,000 e-subscribers. If, if you could provide us with uh, how easily to report, um, I think that that would be a great service that we could assist you with. Um, and we very much want to do that and to be in, in support of, of getting people to uh, make sure that they report. You, you, you know, you inadvertently, you answered two other questions uh, and and, you know, 
Hilma Manessis, and also there's there's a, a program at Congregation Emmanuel called Unity, and uh, Malcolm Gisson and, and Hilma both asked uh, similar questions. Uh, Hilma said, would you be open to participating in peaceful dialogue to include peace, uh, to include police and city officials, faith leaders and community members around police enforcement reform? And Malcolm said, you know, so many of the uh, folk in the black community have never met um, police officers. Yeah, those are two really, really good questions. Let me answer across the board, yes. Dialogue is so important. Uh, and, and Michael, you know, as, as we, uh, two weeks ago now, were preparing for the verdict that might have been with the, uh, the murder of George Floyd and the, the former officer Talvin trial, one of the things that we talked about is, you know, we came together to try to prepare, you know, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And, you know, one of the things that the takeaways, at least for me, is that we have to have these type of come together dialogue, let's work together type of sessions before we have a crisis or a pending crisis, because it's so important to, to have that continual dialogue. Number one, it it, it allows for us to come together a lot quicker when we do have a crisis. And, but secondly, just getting, getting to know, you know each other and what police officers are up to and what we're doing and, and, uh, and us getting to know our community. That's what really makes this work the best. And to the other question about uh, some people, particularly uh, black and African-American people who have never met a police officer, that is so true in so many cases. Now, you know, not all people want to engage with the police, and that's fine too. Uh, but for those that do, it really does help when you can have a conversation outside of a crisis situation. Because oftentimes, if the first time we're meeting somebody is in a crisis, either their crisis or, they're, or you know, they're either been a victim of a crime or committed a crime. That's not the best. That's not the best way to have a you know a meeting with a police officer. That's why we're encouraging officers to engage, get out of your car, speak. Sometimes it's just you know striking up a conversation on the street uh, leads to that type of, you know, that person is just a person like me that has a job to do. And, and that's what we want to get to. And that's why these dialogues are so important. And the more forums we can have to have these type of dialogues, the better we are. And I would ask for this body, if we can do it through your respective uh, churches and synagogues and sit down and, and just have dialogue facilitated conversations, it really does help. So I, that we're willing, I'm willing, and if we could do that, that would be great. I can tell you, uh, we, we will make that commitment, something we are doing right now, Chief, uh, especially with our Asian sisters and brothers, is we've developed a roster of, of Asian clergy to go and speak uh, in, in non-Asian congregations, just to talk about the historical discrimination and the needs right now. Uh, and this is part of our, our role of building bridges. I know the Unity Group at Emmanuel wants to do the same. And so uh, we, we are very much here at the forefront to help you on, on, these, on these matters. Thank you. Just have one or two more questions. Uh, yeah, there was one that Vanessa asked. I just want, I don't know if you covered it, but What's your position on qualified immunity? And do you believe that police officers should be able to claim this protection? Well, I believe that there's going to be some changes on qualified immunity. I don't know that it's gonna happen at a federal level right now because they're, they're deadlocked on this issue. Um, there are parts of, of, of qualified immunity that I do believe in. And that is this, you know, if you are doing your job within the law, within the policies of your 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 department and and that's been proven that you followed the policies you followed the law but the outcome was tragic and and bad i do believe you should be protected i do believe that now if you're outside of policy if you're outside of the scope and course of your duties and definitely if you're outside of law that's a different story and i think that those are the things that are are that our legislatures, legislators rather, are attempting to iron out. And, and you know, I, I think the qualified immunity doctrine and principles were put in place 
and it's mainly for public employees to to have some protection. So if you are doing your job the way you've been asked to do, that you are protected. You know, I, I think it would be wrong, both morally and civically, to say, "Hey, here's what I want you to do: A, B, C, and D, and here's how I want you to do it." And then you follow that to the letter, and you have a mishap, and then you're you're left out there on your own, hanging. I think that's wrong. And that's what qualified immunity is designed to do is offer some protections if you are doing your job within the way you've been asked to do it within the policies. And, and this is a simplistic, I mean, it's a very you know complicated legal uh, doctrine, but uh, and I'm I'm trying to simplify it, but that that's the that's the crux of it. But I believe there's limits to that. I would never ask you to take your badge off, and I know you don't, um, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity just philosophically as Bill Scott uh, to, to talk about this, the broader issue as the last question. Um, <clears throat> Father Donald Godfrey, he's a, a university chaplain, associate director for faculty and staff spirituality at the University Ministry of University of San Francisco. He asks and says, with so many differing police departments, even within a single city and so many differing police jurisdictions all over the country, how do we get to radical anti-racist change within police services of this country? Is such reform even possible or do we just need to start all over? Well, I think if we start all over, um, we're gonna probably end up in the same place because you're gonna start all over with the same society and the same systemic racism across the board, whether you're talking about the educational system, the healthcare system, uh, the criminal justice system, you're still drawing from the same pool of people with the same ideologies. And so I don't know that starting all over is the answer unless you're gonna start all over with people that have been totally deprogrammed, which we can't do. Uh, with this, you know, kind of post-racial idea, you know, where race is no longer a factor. This is Bill Scott talking, and it's just my personal opinion. Uh, that's not our nation. We know we have racism. We know we have people who are racist and have racist ideology, and those people are embedded throughout our society. We know we have systemic racism. Um, and, and, and it goes way beyond policing. So what I think it, on that question is we have to, just like we've done with every other thing in this country uh, that has taken tremendous sacrifice, struggle, people having the courage to put it all on the line for uh, risking their careers and reputations to force change. That's what it's gonna take. And it's going to take re-envisioning, yeah, the criminal justice system, because here's, here's the, the push-pull in this. As much as, as people say, uh, let's blow up the criminal justice system and, and, and start all over, as soon as crime comes to, and I'm going to, this is a broad reach, and I hope this is not offensive to anybody, but this is what I've seen. As soon as their neighborhoods and communities get to, particularly with violent crime, gets touched. They kind of back off of that issue and say, do something about it. I want that person held accountable. I want that person in prison. And you see some very, very uh, good people who can swing on a dime when, it, when crime knocks at their door. And so that's kind of what we have to resist is that type of, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not saying there should not be accountability because I believe there should be accountability. And I believe some people belong in jail. I believe some people belong in prison. I don't believe everybody belongs in prison. I believe some people deserve a second chance, but I think we have to be thoughtful about what that means and just the balance of second, third, fourth, fifth chances and community safety. And that's really where I, I think, yeah, we, we have to make some bold and different decisions, but that's not a safe ground for people. It, you know, it's not safe for me as a police chief to come out and say there's systemic racism in our in our in our criminal justice system. It's not. I've done it. I've said it. But I got to say, it's, and I'm not the only one that does that. But it's not a safe ground because there's 18,000 departments. And believe me, when I come out and say something like that, I get some nasty text, me you know, messages. And you know, I don't follow these police, quote unquote, websites and 
these far right websites, but you know, they, they don't always agree with that position. So it's not a safe ground, it's not a safe space, but everything that has changed in our country when it comes to blowing up systemic racism, fighting for civil rights for all and all that, it's come with sacrifices. It, it has come with people that have had the courage to step in that unchartered, unsafe territory and lay it on the line. That's what we need. Chief, we can't thank you enough. As, as we bring this to a close, you know, we made the commitment earlier. The commitment is ongoing that the council wants to work with you uh, to make San Francisco a better place to build understanding. That is in the core of our mission. I did want to share with you, uh, because we spent a lot of time talking about bias, um, <clears throat> that when I was on the Human Rights Commission, we we mandated uh, implicit bias training uh, for law enforcement officers and, and for that matter, department heads and folks in city government. Um, the Interfaith Council took it a step further and we worked with the Human Rights Commission and we worked with University of San Francisco and we hosted implicit bias training for faith leaders. And it was an eye-opening, a little bit uncomfortable experience but it, it gave us an opportunity to each look into our own souls and, and question the sincerity that we have to the civil rights movement as well. Um, this is something ongoing. It's a commitment ongoing by the council. Uh, we are here. I want to posit this with you um, because uh, I know that, uh, that you can't do it alone and we are here to work with you. Uh, I want to thank you, your, your, your preparation, your presentation, your anticipation of questions, your response to questions was candid, thoughtful, and honest. And, and for that, we are incredibly grateful. Um, and, uh, and, and as we started off saying we pray for you, we end up saying we pray for you. As we're saying thank you, I just also want to thank um, Kushik Roy and Dr. But Reverend Dr. Butler for their participation, Cynthia Zambukas. Uh, from the Interfaith Council for her assistance in putting the program together. Uh, and our, our friends at the COVID Command Center, especially John McKnight, Elisa Karawala, and Sharon Walton. Without this A team, I call it, we couldn't be putting on programs of this substance. We will be sending this out today uh, with uh, resource links. Uh, and we ask our those who are on the call to share this with their communities. And we also ask you to join us next week at this same time when uh, we welcome uh, US Small Business Administration District Director, Julie Close, who will present on programs and grants that could benefit houses of worship and religious institutions facing the financial burdens of COVID mitigation. Uh, God bless you, God keep you. This concludes our program for the day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Chief Scott. Thank you.